This goggle has got some problems. And if you spent $600 on a system like this, you have every right to get a fully working, mostly problem-free system. And that's not where it's at today. So why is it that people like, well, me, for example, seem to be able to have a, a decent experience with it when other people are really struggling and running into these problems and not being able to solve them? What I want to do in this video is show you the way that I have dealt with some of the problems that some people are running into, including problems like sudden stuttering and dropouts, interference with other pilots who are in the air, and so forth. I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're going to learn something today. The first thing you need to do when you get a new set of goggles or anytime you update the firmware of the goggles is unlock the goggles. So if we look here in the menu uh, where we would select channels, you can see that I don't have all eight channels here. I only have one, two, three, and eight, not four, five, and six. And the reason they do this is that the frequencies used by four, five, and six are restricted in Europe. So they ship them with those frequencies turned off. And if you live in Europe, then the good boy thing to do is to not unlock the goggles and not use those channels. But if you live outside of Europe or if you just live in Europe and you don't care, then you can unlock the goggles. The way that you do that is you get a file that you download from the Fat Shark website. I'll put a link in the video description to where you can get that file. You put it on an SD card. You put the SD card into the uh, SD card slot on the front of the goggles. And then you power cycle the goggles. When the goggles power up with an SD card in the slot and those files in the SD card, they will unlock themselves. And there's two things that they unlock. One is the full eight channels, which most people are gonna do, even people living in Europe. And the other is the 1200 milliwatt hack, which uh, raises the maximum output of the goggles from seven, or the, the VTX, from 700 milliwatts to 1200 milliwatts. I'm going to talk a little bit later in this video about why I don't actually recommend you do that at this time. Well, we'll talk more about that in a second. Now that we've done that, if I hit the menu button now, you can see I have all eight channels. Here's another thing that causes people's systems to malfunction. Uh, every time you update your firmware, you need to go to settings, you need to go to device, and you need to reset all. You must do this every time you update your firmware and this will erase your binds and it will cause you to have to unlock the goggles again which is silly but that's just how it is. If you don't do this the system may not appear to function at all you may not be able to bind or you may uh, it may appear to work but then have bad results like bad latency and so forth so make sure you do this every time you update the firmware. Now to get the best performance out of the system you're going to want to make sure that you use the right channel and the key thing is that you need to be using a channel that no one else is using and I don't just mean other fat shark slash walk snail systems if there's other fat shark walk snail systems in use, it will automatically avoid those channels when it detects that they're present. And what will happen is if you've got it set to channel one and someone else is flying on channel one when you power up, it will jump to channel eight. The next piece of advice I want to give you is don't use channel eight. Channel eight is the public channel. It's the dump channel. It's where everybody goes when they got nowhere else to be. It's the waffle house at the end of a long night of drinking. And if you had anywhere else to be, you wouldn't be there. You'd be off on channel one trying to get lucky. But uh, channel eight, don't fly on channel eight because if anybody else powers up, they're gonna hit you, they're gonna jump on channel eight, they're not gonna respect you. But if you are on any of the other channels and someone else powers up, they'll be like, oh, ooh, I'm gonna leave this guy alone and let him do his business and go to channel eight. Now that's true for, for fat shark slash walk snail systems, but if there is another system like a DJI system or an analog system, it will not auto avoid it and you will end up with problems and we'll talk about how to recognize that those problems are happening. I think this is one reason why some people out there have bad experiences because they don't know how to recognize that it's not safe to take off and go fly away and then suddenly they're stuttering and black screens but if they knew what to look for, they would have been able to anticipate that that was gonna happen. So what channel should you pick? Well, look right here and you'll see green bars. If you see green bars next to a channel, that's good. It means nothing else is on that channel. If you see red or black and less than four full bars, it means something else is on that channel and you should avoid that channel. 
The channel that I like to use is channel 7. And the reason for that is it is the highest frequency. It's up in near 5900 megahertz. And it is so high that Wi-Fi doesn't go there. Wi-Fi is one of the most common things that's going to interfere with the performance of your system. And if you're flying by yourself, always go to race band 8 if you're flying analog or channel 7 if you're flying DJI or walk snail and it'll ensure that you're as far or it's channel 3 if you're using 50 megabit per second mode. Use the highest frequency you can and it gets you away from the Wi-Fi uh, little tip. There's a quirk of this system that some people interpret as a bug. It's just bad user interface design and I want to call it out here. Can you see that I'm hitting the back button and nothing is happening? The way the menus work is sometimes you get out of the menu by going up you see here we've got the little selector we go up and now we are out of the menu and now we can move along this top system here and once we're up to the top there if we hit the back button now we're back out of the menu but if I click and go down into the settings simply hitting back doesn't always work it worked there super annoying I know for a fact if I go down and I actually am modifying a parameter, that must be what it is. If I'm modifying a parameter and I hit back, it doesn't back me out. I have to hit the joystick and stop modifying the parameter and then I can use the back button to get out. It's a little bit annoying, but the back button should just always take you back, shouldn't it? Now let's go to settings and I'll show you how I set up my system. And what I want to do is go down to transmit power and I want to encourage you to use the highest transmitter power that you can if you're flying by yourself go ahead and use 700 mega uh, milliwatts but do not at this time use 1000 or 1200 milliwatts right now they do work but they have quirks they do not universally give better performance than 700 milliwatts they might you could try them out but if you're testing out the system and you're having bad problems with like poor image quality or stuttering and you're at 1000 or 1200 milliwatts try dropping down to 700 and see if you get better results 700 is fully stable 1000 and 1200 at least as of today are not fully stable as far as frame rate goes Standard versus high, I recommend that you hot fly on high frame rate. I'm not using that right now because this screen doesn't support 100 frame per second refresh rate, so uh, you're not going to see me do that in this video, but it gives you slightly lower latency, and we can all agree that's a good thing. The only reason you would use standard frame rate would be if you, I guess it might give you a little better image quality, I don't know. As far as resolution goes, again, definitely stick to 720p. As of today, the firmware that we've got, 1080p, is supported, but many people who are trying it out don't feel that it gives a better image quality. Some people do, but I think that the lowest possible latency is going to be what's going to make most people happy and give the most sort of stable performance. Hopefully they'll get that to a point where we can all agree that 1080p is better, it really should be better, but as of today, it's not universally believed to be better. And the same is true for the bitrate. Standard 25 megabit per second bitrate is relatively solid. 50 megabit per second is there, but it feels like they're still tuning it, at least on the firmware that we're looking at today. It is not universally believed to give better performance. And when you use 50 megabit per second, you take up twice as much space. So especially if you're flying with other people, you're gonna to wanna to be down at 25 megabits per second, unless you're sure that you're all flying DJI or Fat, Fat Shark and you know how to space out the channels. But you just get fewer pilots in the air at the same time with 50 megabit per second, whereas with 20, 25, you get more pilots in the air at the same time and less probability of interference. Speaking of interference, we can go back over to transmit power. If you're flying with other people and you want to reduce the probability of interfering with them, you're going to want to turn your output power down a little bit. Uh, 25 milliwatts, frankly, the range of the system is just not very usable at 25 milliwatts. Uh, but 200 milliwatts is a pretty good compromise between getting okay range and penetration while still not interfering too much. There are various things you can do to mitigate interference and allow you to use higher output powers, and we'll talk about them a little later in the video. Next, I want to call your attention to standby mode down here in the bottom of the screen. If you see standby mode at the bottom of the screen, your system is not operating at full output power. And when you arm the quad, you should see standby mode go away. If you don't see standby mode go away when you arm the quad, 
you're not actually at full output power and you're going to get terrible range and penetration. Uh, you need to have the flight controller TX and RX lines connected to the a video transmitter and you need to have MSP enabled in the ports tab in order to let the flight controller talk to the video transmitter. When that happens, when you arm, you'll see standby mode go away. I know there are a couple other things you need to do to set it up, but you'll also be able to get the on-screen display working. Uh, if that's not all working, you need to get that set up and get it working because it just, I mean, it's a basic feature of the system, but more importantly, you want to get the full output power of the system. Uh, if for some reason you're using the system on a aircraft without a flight controller, then you can turn standby mode off here in the menu and it will force it to be at full power all the time, but that will make it overheat a little faster on the bench. You can hear I've got a fan going here to help make sure that mine stays cool. Next, I wanna look at the bit rate and the latency display down here in the lower left of the goggles because this is the single most important thing to check before you take off uh, and it is how you're going to know whether it's safe to fly or whether you're going to take off, get stuttering in black screen and crash your quad. You put the sponsor plug right before a really, really valuable part of the video that people really, really want to see so that they don't just tune out as soon as they realize you're about to do a sponsor plug. And you got to make it short and punchy and not like lead into it with a dumb bit where you're talking to yourself off camera because they'll get bored and they'll click away. Patreon.com is a website where you can sign up to support me for as little as $2 a month or more if you feel like I've earned it. The amount is totally up to you. Patrons get exclusive access to my Discord server and they get to hear podcasts of all my live streams uh, in their podcast reader instead of having to watch it on the YouTube app. If today's the day that I have earned your support, I'd love to have you as a subscriber. There's a link in the video description to my Patreon website. If I haven't earned your support yet, keep watching content. I'll keep making content and maybe that day will come. Okay, so now I gotta tell them the thing that they wanted to hear. So right now we're getting a display of 25-ish milliseconds, which is the best case milliseconds that are displayed when you're in 720p and standard frame rate. If I was in high frame rate, we would see a number of about 21 milliseconds, and if I was in 1080p, we would see a number of, I don't remember, I think it's like 35, maybe 40 milliseconds. I'd have to just put it in that, put it in that mode and look at it when they're, they're very close together here on the bench with no interference and you'll see a stable number. And the key thing to look for is that the number is stable. So if I were in a situation where I had interference, like, got a analog video transmitter here, I think this is 800 milliwatts, crank this sucker up, and I'm just going to bring it down right next to my goggles. I'm bringing it down right next to my goggles. Oh, do you see it's getting all stuttery already? Take a look what this what this uh, latency is doing. Do you see that it's all the frick over the place? Closer I get this to here, the worse. Ah, 200, 400. It's all over the place. If you power up and you're about to go fly, you should always glance down at your latency. And if you see something like this, don't take off. Something is wrong. Now that could be interference from somebody else who's powered up. It could be you've broken your antenna. It could be it could be any number of things. But if you don't see rock solid latency, then something's wrong with your system and you should not take off and you should not fly. And then when you post that YouTube video showing how crappy the system is, something was wrong. Something something's up. Maybe something shouldn't be up. But that's how you can know that something's up. Incidentally, this latency number here is not accurate, at least according to my test results, and Chris Rosser has verified this. In my original review video, I found that the latency was about five or to 10 milliseconds higher than reported, depending on which mode you were in, 720p or 1080p. Chris Rosser recently uh, verified that result on a newer firmware, so the claim that, oh, there was a problem in the old firmware doesn't seem to have been true. Um, regardless of whether that number is actually accurate or not, what you want to look for is stability. The next thing you want to do to get the most out of the system is optimize your antennas. And I think you're going to notice that the people who are having great results with the system are not using the stock walk snail antennas and are oftentimes going to be using higher gain patch antennas like these TrueRC X-Airs as opposed to Omni antennas. The system 
can work okay with Omni antennas, although I found that the walk snail antennas didn't seem to perform very well, and I used aftermarket antennas to get the best results. Um, one of the main things that you need to do is make sure that your patch antenna is on this top right connector. You see, the Fat Shark Walk Snail system is a bi-directional communication system. That means that the video transmitter sends video to the goggles, and the goggles send acknowledgement packets back to the video transmitter to let it know that it got the, uh, got the data. And when that link, when that communication is interrupted, then the link fails. Uh, so you don't just need to be able to hear the signal from the video transmitter, you need to be able to get the signal from the goggles back to the video transmitter for the link to work right. Now, if that's the case, then why do I have my patch antennas on the front like this? And the answer is that when I opened up the goggles to unbrick them, yeah, another problem is that if you interrupt the firmware flash, they're bricked, and unbricking them is pretty freaking involved. When I opened up my goggles to unbrick them, I swapped the UFL connector for these two antennas. So for my goggles, this is the transmit antenna and I have a patch antenna on it. That is going to give you the maximum possible range. Um, it's a little bit silly because most people put their patches on the front and their omnis on top, so why would you not make the transmit antenna one of the front facing ones? I don't know, but there you go. The best performance is going to be had by putting four patch antennas on the goggles. Uh, and that's what you can see guys like Sean Morrison doing. And the, that gives you great penetration in front of you, but it significantly reduces your range out to the sides and behind. That may be a trade-off you're willing to make depending on where you stand and where you fly. I like to have a couple of Omnis because a lot of times I'll be standing in the middle of where I'm flying, like a courtyard in the middle of an office or on my porch in the middle of my property. And so it's usually the case that I want the option to fly all around me, and then if I fly out in one direction, I point the patches that direction. Um, if you know for a fact that you're usually going to be flying in front of yourself, then you could go with two patches, or four patches rather, and you would then get even more penetration in that direction. Now there's one more gotcha with these goggles that you need to be aware of, and this one doesn't affect you directly, but it pisses off all of your friends, and then they're mad at you, and it affects you. The DJI goggles and the Fat Shark goggles use bi-directional communication systems, and that means that the goggles transmit as well as receive. We talked about that when we talked about antenna placement. But uh, the, uh, an effect of that is that if you bring your goggles too close to another person who's flying, you will interfere with them. And this is not the way that analog works. With analog, you only have to worry about the proximity of your video transmitter. That, that's what causes the interference. But the big difference here with the Fat Shark system is that they begin transmitting as soon as they power up. The DJI system, if your video transmitter is powered down, the goggles don't cause interference. And so if you're walking around with your goggles on your head and they're turned on, you're not making trouble for anybody. You don't really need to think about it as long as your quad is powered down. With the Fat Shark Walk Snail system though, anytime your goggles are plugged in, they're interfering. And sometimes significantly, because they're transmitting just basically at full power all the time. So you want to make sure that if you are using this system, that anytime you unplug your quad, you also power down your goggles, especially if you are walking near the flight line or near other pilots who are flying, because you will blast them. And that is somewhat mitigated if you're on a different channel them, than them, but not entirely mitigated uh, depending on how close you are to them. So stay away from other pilots who are flying when your goggles are powered up, regardless of whether your quad is powered up or not. This is really dumb, frankly, and I don't know why it needs to be this way, because DJI doesn't do it this way. It seems like the goggles should be able to know, hey, there's no video transmitter out there, I guess I'm going to just shut up. But they don't do that today, and it's super annoying. I really can't say why these goggles give good performance for some people and not for other people, but I've got to wonder if some of the reason might be that some of the people out there don't know some of the things that I put in this video. So I hope this video has helped you 
get the most out of these goggles and I hope we see better performance from these goggles as time goes on. They definitely still have a lot of room to improve. If you are interested in seeing what these are like to freestyle with in a real environment, I've got a video uh, where I did just that and you can make a judgment of whether the current firmware, at least current as of today, is good enough for your needs. Uh, I'll put a card to that up on screen as well as a link down below to the Madstech video where he got a very different result from his firmware than I did from mine. Is his equipment messed up? I don't know. But two different results. You can go check them out. I'll see you there.